afraid. If you listen carefully, it's not, not my students would tell you, it's not easy to be lectured to. But that's what these guys are going to do. And it's essentially an hour lecture broken into two halves. And if you've ever really concentrated before, this is the, you know, if you haven't before, this is the time to do it. These guys, these very fine advocates, they've done a really good job. I'm, I'm impressed. I'm saying that not to placate. I, I mean that. Uh, because I've had kids come up here and say, you know, their voice made on both sides. Fantastic. That's what I want to hear. Uh, but now they're going to put it all together. In a closing argument, you can say just about anything you want. There are no restrictions as long as you keep a proper decorum. You can talk about the moon, the sun, the stars, just about anything. You can't lie. Uh, you can't say that there is evidence that's been presented what, that hasn't been, but you can point to anything. Uh, I've seen some remarkable closing arguments, some very good, some just absolutely preposterous. Uh, the probably, you have to give jurors, I'm just giving you a little lesson here for a minute. Jurors are pretty smart. The jury system really does work. You've got to give jurors a lot of credit. Uh, they're lay people, but they get it. Um, one alone, maybe yes, maybe no. But you put 12 people together, or six, or 10, or how big your jury is, and they, they work it out. They're not, they're not stupid. Uh, but the advocates are trying to teach you. Again, their statements are not evidence they're going to try and persuade you. And they're going to put all their evidence together, and they can talk about their own evidence and what you should concentrate on and what's, uh, what's uh, the most significant. And they can also talk about the other sides and why you should disregard or ignore or give a little weight to certain points. I don't, you know, I've seen cases where they talked about all the evidence that went on forever and ever. I don't think these guys have the time to do it. So there will be several points they will raise about the other side's argument that, that they will tell you you should not regard it or that uh, it doesn't have merit and why. But they will stress their own evidence and their own point of view. And hopefully it's organized, it's coherent, it's very hard to do uh, because it has to be in good order. And again, I use the word well-organized sort of interesting, even in the most dry subjects, to keep people awake and attentive. And you guys, the judges, should be taking very good notes and listening very carefully. A lot of what you'll hear has been repeated. It's, they said it at judges' questions. But that's OK. It's not a problem. This is their time. All right? Everybody got that? No. Uh, the only object, no objections at all. Nobody should say a word except me, and that's only if one side is being horribly rude to the other or just completely out of line. But in closing argument, there's a little adage, you just don't object. It's not proper. Judges get very angry when uh, young attorneys say, oh, I object to this. And what they're doing is trying to stop the flow. You know, the other the guy who's giving, or the woman who's giving the uh, closing argument is on a roll, and to stop the flow, you object. But judges don't like it. And when a judge gets down on, a, on an advocate, the jury, first of all, if, if he or she is doing the, you know, making the, the decision, uh, they'll, they'll remember that. And if the jury hears the judge yell at, a, at an advocate, they don't forget that either, either. So you need to be very careful. But no, no objections. Let them say what they want to say. Uh, if it's completely untrue, uh, I'll, I'll know that. I mean, they're making things up. But you know, you're smart. And jurors are smart. Jurors will say, well, that's, this person's talking about this. But there was no evidence to that. And that really wasn't true. And they'll sit in the deliberation room and they'll they, they get it. They know. And you guys are very bright. You will get it as well. All right? Uh, I'll probably say more at the next case in terms of the closing argument. This is, this is pretty crucial. 
So the advocates for Costa Rica, you have, uh, we'll allow you, this is a little odd because it's, there's a counterclaim, but we'll do it according to form. Uh, you have 30 minutes. You can use part of that time now and part of that time after Nicaragua is completed, but no more than a total of 30 minutes. You can both be involved, but not like a jack-in-the-box where one is up and one is down and one does two minutes and the next does two minutes. Uh, it's best if one of you does, you know, your portion now and the other person finishes it up where the same person can do the whole thing if that's completely up to you. And then when you're done with your first part, assuming you are going to break the time, uh, then Nicaragua has 30 straight minutes. That's the maximum. It doesn't have to be 30. I've seen four hours and I've seen 20 minutes or 10 minutes. Jurors like less. <laughs> but, you know, it's your case. Are there any questions from the advocate about what, how this works? Yes? No? Yeah. And according, as far as Nicaragua, you know, uh, presumably, hopefully, one of you will stand up and do a period of time and then maybe the other one will do the rest. Uh, of the time, uh, or one person will do the whole thing. I don't, it, it doesn't matter to me. It's up to you guys. Judges, do you have any questions? No? All right. Let's begin. Do the applicants have a closing speech? Yes, we do. Okay. You may start with your closing statements. You'll have half an hour and you can split it for <coughs> And I want you to be very loud so that everybody can hear and don't talk too fast. Because these guys will be taking notes, and I've heard some brilliant closing arguments where the person talks so quickly that people miss bits and pieces because they're trying to type things down. So don't worry if you go a little, if, if you think I'm talking a little slowly, people will appreciate it. Loud and clear and relatively slow. Go ahead. Honorable judges, most distinguished president and fellow advocates, my co-advocate, Claire Cole, and I, as Costa Rican advocates, hope to have shown that Nicaragua will damage the environment if dredging operations in relation to the construction of the canal will continue without an environmental impact assessment. We also hope to have shown that Costa Rica has acted in keeping with domestic and international law and its sovereign obligations regarding the construction of a road near the San Juan River. Costa Rica, in relation to the first case, would like to point out that the dredging done by Nicaragua, whilst it is helping get rid of an abundance of sedimentation, is primarily effective in securing preliminary constructional measures for the creation of an inter-oceanic canal. Although we see the benefits that a canal will bring to the economy, we only ask for an environmental impact report to be done and for Nicaragua to include Costa Rica in the plans for the construction of the canal as it will affect the whole of Latin America. We would also like to point out that although Nicaragua states that they dredged in reaction to Costa Rican environmental damage, Nicaragua should have provided a separate environmental assessment report in terms of dredging. Both parties agree about the importance of the EIA and in this case, Costa Rica had a legal and liable reason to the delay the presentation of the EIA. We would also like to emphasize that in the preliminary provisions, the court allowed the continuation of the dredging, but only provisionally, due to the uncertainty of the actual reasons for the dredging. As evidence eight clearly shows, the government of Nicaragua is already in the legal stage of planning the construction of the canal, and it is commonly known a vital part of the construction of a canal involves the dredging of the river. We believe that although we agree that dredging gets rid of excessive sedimentation, which is positive for the environment, the true purposes of the dredging are related to the construction of the canal. Next, we would like to point out that this trans-oceanic canal is to be built and overseen by the H. KMD company, which is a Chinese company. The confidential report of the HKND company, also marked as evidence 8, prepares to instruct railways, several roads, and an international airport alongside the canal. 
The pollution and salt water coming from the canal through Lake Nicaragua will directly affect the San Juan River. In evidence nine, biologist Uet Perez, president of the Academy of Sciences of Nicaragua, stated that at least one previous impact study on a possible canal through Lake Nicaragua resulted in the project being deemed too destructive to the environment and that the canal would be a disaster for biological diversity and ecology. It could undo millions of years of evolution. The canal would cut straight through Nicaraguan land and nature, cutting millions of trees and polluting the sweet water with the ocean salt water. This can have horrible effects on the fish in the San Juan River and increases the risk of water shortages and flooding due to the major changes in the water system. Even the independent Liberal Party legislator of Nicaragua, Mr. Elicio Nunes himself, said that we are going to hand over the country's sovereignty without knowing where the canal is going to go, how much it's going to cost, its ecological impact, or how long its construction is going to last. The Cleveland Award, Evidence 1, states that Costa Rica has the right in cases where the construction of a Nicaragua Nicaraguan Canal will involve an injury to the right of Costa Rica to express her opinion or advice as more than advisory or consultative. Furthermore, Nicaragua asks for compensation from Costa Rica in its ICJ request to bring the San Juan environment back to its prior state before the construction of the road began. While Costa Rica has ensured this will be done by her, especially since the previous ICJ case did not rule that Costa Rica must pay Nicaragua to navigate the river. The intentions of Nicaragua's request should be put into doubt. In other words, we believe Nicaragua is just looking out for money to obtain and not for ecological protection. Now we would like to make clear that Costa Rica constructed the road to defend our own sovereignty and territorial integrity. In 2010, Nicaraguan troops occupied and used hostilities on our land, known as Isla Calera. This put our country into imminent threat as we were not able to access the land well, nor do we have any army as was abolished by the Constitution seen in Evidence 7. Our police force was not allowed to navigate on the river. Therefore, our only option was to reach the occupied troop by land. As Evidence 13 explains, the risk of having the conflict intensify would potentially result in communities being displaced, which requires an overland route to facilitate evacuation, mobilization, and advocacy. Nicaragua threatened to shoot down Costa Rican aircrafts and use unacceptable levels of harassment if Costa Ricans would navigate the river. As Evidence 16 claims, the occupation of Nicaraguan troops even destructed the fragile national wetlands of the island. The constant aggressions from Nicaragua were unacceptable. Evidence won the Cleveland Award, signed by both countries, reinforced the fact that Costa Rica's rights are breached when any place belonging to her on the right bank of the San Juan River is occupied without her consent. This situation brought Costa Rica in a state of emergency, which had to be addressed. Our constitutional system provides for special norms that allow the executive branch to address emergency situations so that action can be as agile and decisive as merited by the circumstance. It was Costa Rica's duty to protect their national sovereignty, its preservation and defense, which made the state exercise all necessary measures in observance with international and domestic law. We would like to emphasize Article 1 and 2 of the decree shown in Evidence 50. Article 1 states that a state of emergency is declared in the following villages on the border with Nicaragua. La Cruz, Upala, Los Chiles, Sarapiqui, San Carlos, and Popochi. And also the situations and or processes that are being unleashed as a result of the activities illicitly carried out by Nicaragua on Costa Rican territory, which threaten the life, physical integrity, and property of those within national territory, as well as the national sovereignty and the environment. <coughs> Article, two state, Article 2 states that 
To that effect, the present declaration of a state of emergency includes the three phases established in the National Law on Emergencies and Risk Prevention, which are as follows. A, the response phase, B, the rehabilitation phase, and C, the reconstruction phase. Costa Rica did not create an environmental assessment report prior to the creation of the road. However, the crisis state Nicaragua had brought Costa Rica in made it necessary for the state to temporarily discard the impact assessment. Evidence 13 explains that given our country was invaded <coughs> and threatened, conducting an impact study as a condition to carry out the work of the road would have delayed any action for defense for months, if not years. After the Nicaraguan troops left Costa Rica territory, we began conduct conducting the environmental evaluation. As Article 9 of Evidence 13 states, this assessment will be done by international independent experts to ensure objectivity and technical weight. The impact assessment will oblige fully to international law and will be shared with Nicaragua immediately. Therefore, Nicaragua has no grounds to argue against the impact assessment. They were in fact the cause themselves for its delay. The United Nations Charter says in Article 2, Subclause 3, all members shall settle their international disputes by peaceful means in, su in such a manner that international peace and security and justice are not endangered. As Nicaragua did not abide this article, Costa Rica found it imperative pr to protect their sovereignty by peaceful means. As evidence 13 holds, Nicaragua decided to distract their military invasion on our land by beginning a smear campaign against Costa Rica during the construction of the road. While ignoring their aggression on their land, they began to claim that the road posed a potential threat to the San Juan environment. We would like to point out the true scope of the environmental damage caused and the effective remediation works currently undertaken on the road. Nicaragua has repeatedly argued that the construction of the road causes sediment to erode and wash away in the river. This state claim has potential negative effects on the tourism, <coughs> trade, and fishing industry, and damages the environment. Evidence 4 and 11 clearly remark that sediment is essential for the San Juan River. Evidence 4 states that it enriches the soil with nutrients. The soil with nutrients. Areas rich in sediment are often also rich in biodiversity. Sedimentary soil is better for farming. Deltas and riverbanks, where much sediment is deposited, are often the most fertile agricultural areas in a region. Erosion is also a natural process, which moves sediment from one place to another. If the erosion of sediment is erupted, as Evidence 11 states, the flow of the San Juan may become sediment starved and prone to erode the channel bed and banks. It is thus clear that sediment is not a major issue for the environment at hand. In fact, the construction of the road will contribute less than 2% of the river's total amount of sediment. Are the Nicaraguan advocates claims on 1-2% to of sediment in the river due to our road truly that damaging? We recognize that the initial condition of the road was potentially damaging to the river. We therefore promise to ensure that the surrounding San Juan environment will be in a state prior to the construction of the road. Nicaragua continues to claim that we must undertake mitigation works, yet they do not realize that we are already far ahead into the process of remediation. Although we not have the EIA yet, we are already conducting several analysis reports because we do not want to delay nor allow for the environment to be damaged. Evidence 10, which is an initial environmental analysis done on the road by a well-recognized expert in the field to advise the government on what areas of the road need intervention. We would first like to point out to you that this report concluded that 73% of the road, the large majority, is in a condition of environmental balance and thus needs no remediation. So Costa Rica deems it as an irrational request to stop constructing the road, while most of the road is already declared environmentally safe. Only 27% requires little environmental actions, corresponding to a mere, uh, only 
23%, requires little environmental actions, corresponding to a mere 7% of the 120 kilometer road that needs urgent intervention. These results clearly demonstrate that although the road poses some potential threats to the environment, the majority of the roads are the safe state. The report also gave the government of Costa Rica advice on remediation works to do. It showed that cut and fill slopes, the hectares of cut off forestry, and maintenance and control were our priorities. Starting off with sediment control, the state has implemented sedimentation traps that work as filters to block impure sediment from eroding. These works are temporary, as sediment from the road will become covered by vegetation that protects them from erosion. So in the long run, sediment will pose no threat to the San Juan River and the environment. At a few stretches of the road, intervention was necessary to give cuts and fill slopes a more stable design that prevents them from landslides. If you look at the pictures represented in Evidence 14, you will see <coughs> that Costa Rica is undertaking all necessary measures to stabilize these slopes and sludge traps. Our government will continue these mitigation works until the road meets the international and domestic required level <coughs> of environmental safety. Evidence 5 explains that more than 700 volunteers planted nearly 50,000 trees last year. The Environment Ministry plans to plant 200,000 trees along the length of the border in total. Not only does this show our commitment to restore the flora that has been removed by the construction of the road, it also shows the dedication of volunteering Costa Ricans who believe in a protected and preserved nature in the San Juan area. This leads me to my next point on the environmental aspect of the road. It is evident that Nicaragua's environmental concerns will all be resolved by Costa Rica's remediation works. So there is no issue on that. We'd like to reinforce that Costa Rica and Nicaragua share the same environmental desires and concerns for the San Juan River. There are absolutely no intentions of Costa Rica to misuse the river's environment. Costa Rica serves nearly 6% of the world's biodiversity and is ranked fifth by the Environmental Performance Index. We've signed 45 different environmental treaties and received a Future Policy Award four years ago. Our government is extremely dedicated to protecting and preserving the Central American biodiversity. There is no reason for Nicaragua to question our ability to conserve the San Juan River during the construction of the road. We would like to inaugurate the tremendous economic and social benefits of the road. The road will provide access to northern Costa Rican land near the San Juan, one of, mo one of Costa Rica's most isolated and forgotten areas. The road is created to connect this forlorn part of Costa Rica to the rest of the country. Previously, as mentioned by the Public Security Minister Zamora in Evidence 6, it would take 10 hours of walking for that region to reach any form of contact with society. This road will provide security within the region as Costa Rica will station police officers in charge of preventing arms and drug smuggling in the area. The new road will also protect Costa Rican citizens from armed Nicaraguan soldiers. It will benefit 2,500 families and employ around 7,000 laborers. Along with the construction of the road comes the extension of electricity to 100 families and newly built schools. These are inalienable rights that every one of our citizens is entitled to. Before this, there were only paths for all-terrain vehicles or horses. Costa Rica is committed to sustainable forms of tourism along the road too such as leading a bicycle tour of the area to help visitors get to know the natural beauty of the region. Exports of Costa Rican goods and services are 37.7% of its GDP, implying the necessity of transportation routes of these goods. Nicaragua, too, can prosper from the road, as it aids Nicaragua to get a handle on issues like illegal immigration and drug smuggling. This road brings basic human rights that all human beings are entitled to as the UDHR states. No member 
States of the United Nations would deny these citizens the right to basic principles like ele electricity, sanitation, and education. As some judges previously mentioned alternative solutions in regard to the construction of the road, Costa Rica would like to reaffirm that the main solution that benefits all is the construction of a road. As all of you know, a road is a vital and simple piece of infrastructure often taken for granted. We find it imperative to construct a road for the above mentioned reasons. We would also like to point out that Nicaragua does not desire the road to be stopped due to the fact that it is a road. They are merely asking for the EIA, which will be provided in the coming months. We would like to point out that any other means for connecting the north of Costa Rica to the mainland, although might be valid to some extent, are not as efficient as a road. To travel by boat would not only be an inefficient allocation of time, but would also overuse our navigational rights on the San Juan River. To travel by air is simply unrealistic. The main concern of Nicaragua and Costa Rica is a shared concern. We are not in any way trying to damage the environment, as we not only have a reputation to uphold, but we also want to protect and defend the environment in the best way possible for economic prosperity, and good relations. Honorable judges, we wish to reserve time to conclude our arguments after the advocates of Nicaragua have spoken. You will have uh, 11 minutes to conclude after the respondents deliver their closing statements. <coughs> Costa Rica. 
The drying up of the river would have entirely destroyed the tourism industry for both Nicaragua and Costa Rica that is based on the river. It would have also had vast economic impacts on Nicaragua as the largest sector of Nicaraguan's economy, Nicaragua's economy is agricultural, which encompasses fishing industries, as outlined in Evidence F. The drying up of the river is also an ecological disaster, as, is, as it is the destruction of the habitat of many aquatic species. As both concerned parties are worried about the environment, it is paramount that the effects of the San Juan River drying up is taken into account so that it can be acknowledged that the threat of the San Juan River drying up is constituted as an emergency. Nicaragua is willing to comply with international standards and provide an EIA, but requests to continue the dredging efforts to ensure that the river does not dry up, which is the priority in this situation. The next issue, which is related to the dredging, is the Inter-Oceania Canal. Nicaragua would like to also clarify the dispute regarding the construction of the Inter-Oceania Canal. This is a project that will likely begin after the dredging operation in December of 2014, as it is a continuation of the dredging operation. Nicaragua would like to restate that whilst no EIA has been completed at this point in time, the construction of the canal has not begun. Nicaragua intends on completing and sharing an EIA with Costa Rica before the construction of the canal commences, as stipulated by international protocol. Since the construction hasn't commenced and the mission is currently solely an environmental one, Nicaragua requests that the court con courts consents to allow continuation of dredging. As alluded to yesterday, the proposed canal would offer economic benefits for both countries. This canal would open up trade routes which would allow better trade within these two countries and provide better access to remote regions. The United States of America currently holds a monopoly on the trade routes through Latin America as it has substantial influence and is the main benefactor of the Panama Canal. Whilst the plans for the canal are not final and no EIA has yet been carried out, the advocates for Nicaragua implore that the judges and the opposing counsel take into account the immense economic benefits for both parties. However, whilst saying this, as the construction of the canal has not yet begun, and thus the provision of an EIA is not yet relevant, Nicaragua sees Costa Rica's demand for an EIA with the, sorry, with the Inter-Oceania Canal as moot as it will pre be provided in time. On the topic of economic benefit, Nicaragua wishes to further its case in allowing the dredging of the San Juan River to continue. From an economic standpoint, it is advantageous for both parties if the waterway is sustainable and flowing. As stated in the stipulations, uh, stipulation 12, Costa Rica has a strong tourism industry that, in part, relies on the San Juan River. By sustaining a steady, steady level of environmental sustainability, both parties can continue to host a strong tourism industry on the San Juan River. This is, of course, in the best interests of both states economically. I will now pass over to the second advocate for Nicaragua, who will continue our council's case, speaking specifically about the construction of the road along the San Juan River and related issues. Now I will speak to the second half of the case, which is the construction of the road along the San Juan River by Costa Rica. We feel that this, is the, this case has been the main focus of the last two days and urgently requires action in order to stop severe environmental damage from continuing to occur. This has been a severely contentious issue and we strongly feel that a decision must be made here in order to safeguard the environment as it is the duty of both member states and of the utmost importance. 
In this latter case, we have seen three main points heavily debated. The first is the question of the actual purpose of the road being constructed by Costa Rica. We have heard of numerous supposed purposes, but are yet to see any hard evidence or hear any witness statements that have proven beyond reasonable doubt its purpose. From the advocates of Costa Rica, we have heard varying answers, starting with the road's purpose being for defence. This is per a previous situation between Nicaragua and Costa Rica, which prevented Costa Rican armed forces from going onto the river if a dispute occurred, which is why, when Nicaraguan military forces invaded El Calero, felt it necessary to build the road to provide access to the area for their police force. Since then, the Nicaraguan forces have been removed. The pur this purpose for the road is now moot. However, we have thus heard the purpose shift to the need to connect the northern region, region of Costa Rica with the rest of the country, thus providing education, jobs, and sanitary care to all locals with the only, with the only piece of the um, applicant's evidence which refers to this being um, evidence six, which briefly alludes to connecting schools um, as a small part of the purpose of building the road. But then we have also been informed by the Costa Rican advocates that the primary purpose of the road is for tourism and that Costa Rica must improve their infrastructure for the growing influx of tourists, as pointed out in the stipulations. Thus, we have been told three entirely different purposes, but are yet to see any hard evidence or hear witness statements that prove that any of these are true, rendering all three moot. Nicaragua also strongly believes that the construction of the road is pointless and unnecessary, as any of these three purposes could have been solved and achieved if Costa Rica utilised their right to navigate the San Juan River. The economic benefits of the road have been discussed and even weighed up with the detrimental environmental effects. However, <coughs> if the river was used instead to connect the northern region of Costa Rica, then both the economic benefits from tourism and other de industries will continue, as well as the environment being preserved, which is of the utmost importance to both states. There is currently no purpose for the road, and thus the construction should cease immediately until an environmental impact assessment <coughs> has been carried out by both parties. The second point is the question of the obligations of whether both Costa Rica and Nicaragua have to undertake an environmental impact assessment, or EIA, as per the Convention on the Law of the Non-Navigational Uses of International Water Courses, which is evidence C. All articles are extremely relevant to this case, but two to highlight are Articles 7 and 12, which discuss states' obligations to protect other countries from environmental harm and how to amend any harm caused. Both Costa Rica and Nicaragua have voted in favour of this convention being adopted and have thus signed the convention, but are yet to ratify it. As this 1997 resolution is from the General Assembly, a 51% majority was needed to pass it and therefore enter the convention, the convention as an international procedure. So far, this convention has been ratified by um, 33 member states, and it must be ratified by 50 member states to become a part of international law. However, there are also many promises for um, more states to ratify it in the future. This means that it is highly likely that this convention will become a part of international law in the near future. Currently, as it stands, Nicaragua sees it as an international guideline, as a large majority of member states were in favour of adopting this convention, and therefore, by definition, it becomes international standard. Therefore, Nicaragua believes that this convention is highly relevant and should be considered seriously, regardless of whether either, either member state has ratified it. It is common practice to use this convention, it has become an international standard, and it is likely to become a part of international law in the near future. The third major point has been the question of environmental damage caused, how to determine this with an EIA, and whether aid should be given to help repair the damage. Both states have reiterated that environmental protection is hugely important and of the utmost priority. Costa Rica filed the first half of this case due to their concern for the environment with the lack of an EIA, setting a precedent for the need of this assessment. However, in this case, it seems as though Costa Rica 
a country which often proclaims their impressive track record in environmental protection and biodiversity, has failed to acknowledge the effects to the environment whatsoever, which have been caused by the negligent actions of constructing the road. In evidence D, the article talks of the effects on the San Juan River, which were found in a research study by the Humboldt Center, which found that agrochemicals and toxic waste had already become a problem, and it was expected to get worse should road construction continue. In evidence B, which is a case study, it is clearly stated how sedimentation can negatively affect the environment. So far, it has been found that bank erosion, meandering, flooding, and loss of aquatic habitat have occurred, with smaller effects also occurring and more expected to occur. Had an EIA been undertaken prior to the construction, then this would have eliminated any potential environmental damages, allowing Costa Rica to make a better informed decision on the construction of the road. This leads us on to how an EIA should be undertaken. Both sides agree that EIAs are needed to determine environmental damage, yet Costa Rica has refused to undertake one until recently when they received pressure from the international community. In evidence A, it is noted that an EIA should be completed before decision making takes place of whether to continue with plans for a certain project. An EIA will then show what the environmental risks or therefore lack of are. Quite simply, Costa Rica needed to complete this assessment prior to the project commencing and had the environment felt no negative impacts, then it could have continued as planned. Unfortunately, this is not the case and it is due to the environmental effects in this area that we are here today. As these effects have occurred, and numerous sources have confirmed this, the question of compensation must come about, as Costa Rica is in the wrong for harming the environment. Article 7 from the previously mentioned convention also just suggests that this is a way forward. But Nicaragua quite honestly believes that Costa Rica is responsible for the damage, and therefore should do their utmost to repair this whether this be monetary or through resources. Obviously, their current work has not been enough, so the court today must decide how those accountable can fix the problems they have caused. Besides from this, Nicaragua has constantly been referred to as an aggressor in reference to other disputes with other nations. The advocates in Nicaragua see this as totally irrelevant and a separate issue from this case being debated today, and therefore not justified to be brought into the court. However, this particular case today, as we all know, is blatantly important for Nicaragua and has been taken to the ICJ to ensure it is solved in a diplomatic fashion. We have also felt that much of the evidence given by the advocates for Costa Rica has to be questioned and little weight given due to the reliability of the sources, as many have originated from the Costa Rican government and their agencies, thus bringing bias into play. And the advocates of Costa Rica have also admitted, admitted that bias is involved with these documents. The advocates from Nicaragua have used sources without bias, such as sources from countries such as New Zealand, which are not involved in this dispute. Therefore, evidence offered by the respondents is therefore much reliable in this sense than the applicants. So to conclude, we as the advocates from Nicaragua have clearly stated our views on the proceedings and call upon all judges to make a conscious de decision today. We have seen many areas of contention in this case, but believe that we have clearly outlined the issues discussed and have de demonstrated Nicaragua's perspective on the impending ruling. In the entirety of the case, we have highlighted how and why the dredging of the San Juan River is vital and must continue, the lack of provisions of EIAs by both member states, the issue of the construction of the Inter-Oceania Canal, the purpose of the road along the Costa Rican border of the San Juan River, the alternatives possible to the road, the importance of the international law surrounding this issue, and the effect of the construction of the road on the San Juan River. Although many, uh, many, although many in number, all of these points have been hugely important to the case, and all must be, must be considered and discussed accordingly. As we conclude this case, Nicaragua requests firmly that the Costa Rica completes and shares freely all findings of an environmental impact assessment as soon as possible to determine the damage that they have already caused and other impacts that will occur if the project continues. 
Another request is that the preliminary ruling stating that Nicaragua may continue with dredging, that Ilsa Clara belongs to Costa Rica, and that both states must remove any armed forces from disputed areas, is to be upheld and transformed into the final ruling. Nicaragua would also like to, to request that any endeavours in the future within a five kilometre radius or those likely to cause damage to the San Juan River have been subject, subjected to an EIA report which will be shared freely between both states and thus allow for both states to make a decision on whether or not projects affecting both countries should continue. Nicaragua also requests that the construction of the road ceases immediately and that other alternatives such as the use of the San Juan River be explored by Costa Rica in order to prevent environmental harm but also encourage the economic benefits that come with this. Finally, Nicaragua requests that Costa Rica provides aid as compensation for the damage caused by their project, whether this be monetary or in resources. Aid is to be used purely to restore the San Juan River to its original state or better, with restoration reaffirming both states' commitments to ensuring environmental sustainability as well as economic and social benefits for both countries. Fellow advocates, honourable judges, distinguished guests and of course the honourable president. The advocates in Nicaragua would like to conclude their case today by asking the court to make a conscious decision regarding the issues discussed today. Thank you for your time and consideration. Did everyone get the prayer? Uh, well, what I'm going to ask you to do, uh, both Nicaragua and Costa Rica, Nicaragua, you just listed five requests if I count it correctly. Yes. Uh, and they were stated quite well. Have them on one page. You know, have your computer delete the you know, whatever was previous to your stating the five points that you made and the thank yous at the end. So just give us those five points on one sheet of paper sure. if you can give that to Dama, and I'll ask Costa Rica to do the same with their prayer, to isolate it and put it on one page, your request, and then we'll, we'll have your both sides, each side's prayer. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can continue up. with their speech. Uh, you have 11 minutes. Honorable <coughs> judges. Before you proceed to writing the verdict, we would like to clarify the truth behind this dispute. After demonstrating the arguments behind our tangible evidence, we ask the judges to now pay close attention to Nicaragua's pieces of evidence. When you observe the respondent's evidence A, the page on environmental impact assessment, it proves when and how the EIA has to be undertaken. We regard the implementation of the EIA with utmost respect and believe that both Nicaragua and Costa Rica are obliged to follow these articles. However, these promising words did not reflect the actions of both parties. We have given you the evidence to why we did not conduct the impact assessment before the construction of the road began. Nicaraguan troops occupied our land, we were threatened not to use the river, and thus there was no other option but to access the conflicted land via a road. We felt the responsibility, above all means, to protect our sovereign state from what could have led to a Nicaraguan invasion. No charter, country, or independent organization would deny a country the right to protect their citizens. This emergency state, as allowed under our constitution, justifies our reasoning to delay the conducting of an EIA. Furthermore, we have proof of our commitment to providing the CIA as soon as possible and remediate any necessary works to bring the environment back to the state before the construction. Likewise, we are requesting in court for Nicaragua to provide a DIA on the canal too. Dredging can be beneficial and so can a canal. We would be more than satisfied to approve the dredging <coughs> and canal works carried out on Nicaragua's behalf. However, we believe Nicaragua is legally obliged to consult with Nicaragua, Costa Rica upon the dredging and canal by conducting an EIA. Nicaragua wasn't in an emergency state. 
Yet still, Nicaragua decided it was unnecessary to conduct an EIA on the dredging activities, nor have they promised to conduct one for a canal. The fact that Nicaragua neglected to undergo an EIA on the dredging works is exactly why we are concerned. The advocates of Nicaragua may claim that it was an emergency state, but there is no evidence provided in this court. Therefore, we cannot conclude that their situation with the dredging was a true emergency state. Yes, Nicaragua may state in evidence I that dredging is vital to the conservation of the environment and regard it as safe. Yet, why does Nicaragua then not share the IA with us, proving that the dredging works will indeed be safe and beneficial to the environment. They may have provided evidence on the safety of dredging in general, but submitted nothing that ensures the way Nicaragua carries out dredging works is safe as well. This explains why Costa Rica was and still is suspicious of Nicaragua's ways of dredging near the San Juan. Then in 2010, Nicaragua announced to conduct, to construct a canal. This is directly related to their dredging. Our evidence proves that the construction of a canal can cause irreparable damage to the San Juan environment and hereby violate our navigational rights. Again, we find it suspicious that Nicaragua has provided zero tangible evidence on the construction of their canal or even defending the benefits and safety of it with real proof. Furthermore, it is also not clear the Nicaragua ensures to share an EIA prior to the construction of the canal. Once again, the advocates may say that they will ensure an EIA to be conducted and shared with us, but there is no evidence of this truly happening. So to conclude the first case upon a canal, the evidence of both parties stated all. There is no proof by Nicaragua whatsoever that they will ensure their dredging works or construction of the canal to be safe. There's no evidence on Nicaragua conducting and sharing a DIA with Costa Rica about the canal or the dredging. All we simply ask for Nicaragua to clarify is to clarify their actions. If the court rules to order Nicaragua to conduct the EIA on the construction of the canal and allow Costa Rica to have a more than consultative opinion on these activities, the two parties can solve this issue in a diplomatic and respectful manner. Moving on to the construction of the road. I'd like to point out respondents evidence B, C, D, and G. Let's begin with evidence C and G. The two pieces by Nicaragua, which we believe are completely unreliable towards the case. Documents judges should not base their verdict on. Evidence G talks of research on Nicaragua's agriculture in 1958 to 1959 more than 55 years ago. Yes, it states the importance of Nicaragua's fishing industry, but as a matter of fact, Costa Rica shares very similar exports and imports too. If the fishing industry in the San Juan could potentially be harmed due to the road, wouldn't both parties be concerned? We share the same, if not more, environmental concerns around the San Juan. To damage Nicaragua or Costa Rica's fishing industries is a consequence we never wish to come through. Therefore, as mentioned previously, we will do anything it takes to protect and preserve the San Juan environment during the construction of the road. If you took a look, uh, take a look at Respondent's Evidence C, the Convention on the Law of the Non-Navigational Uses of International Water Forces, you will notice that, that this lacks liability too. The evidence is a mere draft. Although adopted by the General <coughs> Assembly in 1997, it has still not been put into force. Neither Nicaragua nor Costa Rica has ratified this convention. Therefore, any arguments the advocates of Nicaragua wish to make on this convention should simply be non-existent, as Costa Rica is not bound to do anything the evidence states. Finally, I would like to ask the judges to hereby closely look into respondents, evidence B and D. Evidence B talks about sediment the soil in our streets. We have proven to you previously that sediment enriches the water with nutrients and is crucial to the nature of the water. A river has two main components, water and sediment. Without enough sediment, 
the river, will, the river will simply become stark. Now we completely agree, as Evans B states, that too much sediment can cause damage, <coughs> such as clogging stream channels. Nicaragua argues that the road will damage the San Juan River in such ways. Yet when you look at the second page of Evans B, it offers suggestions on how to protect and control sediment erosion, on of which is one of which is focused on vegetative cover, a method to reinforce the soil and hold it in place to protect sediment from eroding. Matter of fact is, Costa Rica has already <coughs> undergone this exact type of sediment protection. Applicants Evidence 10 clearly explains the same way to remediate sedimentation and protect the river from such harm. Therefore, the complaints of Nicaragua addressed in Evidence B and D have already been taken care of by Costa Rica. Not only have they been taken care of, Evidence D focused on the completion of the viaduct of 160 kilometers. We would like to point out that there is a clear difference between a viaduct and a road, and that therefore this road, this source, decreases in reliability even more. Having just shown your honors, that all of Nicaragua's pieces of evidence are either unnecessary, as we've already taken care of Nicaragua's complaints, or non-existent, we must come to the conclusion that the truth behind this merged dispute is self-evident. Honorable judges, it is clear that Nicaragua has failed to demonstrate any basis for her request. Costa Rica has obliged fully in accordance with domestic and international law. We ask the court to demand an environmental impact assessment concerning the creation of the Interoceanic Canal and ask that Costa Rica has a more than consultative role in the planning of the canal. In relation to the construction of the road, we will provide the environmental impact assessment that confirms with international law and we will share it with Nicaragua. We will also continue the remediation works and if Nicaragua wishes that they can give us consultative advice on environmental protection, they may do so. We have and are undergoing the necessary remediation works to ensure the road to be safe and wish to provide principal rights our citizens deserve. This request filed by Nicaragua is, sim is a simple misappropriation for the time and the resources of the courts from nuanced issues. We wish, on behalf of the Republic of Costa Rica, to extend our appreciation to the President and judges for your kind and considered attention. Thank you. Round of applause, everyone. Uh, well done to both. Uh, you know, I've had advocates.